Howdy, Moss. Mawkishly. You're just in time. Okay, Periscope's working sweet. Um, and chapter 16 begins. Cancer Ward. Chapter 16. Absurdities. He was crawling. He was crawling along a concrete tube. No, not a tube. A tunnel, perhaps. With uncovered steel bars jutting out from its sides. Sometimes he'd get caught on them just at the right of his neck, where it hurt. He was crawling on his belly, and what he felt most was the heaviness of his body pressing him against the earth. A heaviness much greater than the weight of his body. He wasn't used to it. It was flattening him. He thought at first it was the concrete crushing him from above. But no, it was his body that was so heavy. As he dragged it along, it felt like a sack of scrap metal. He was so heavy, he thought he'd never be able to get up on his feet again. Only one thing mattered now, to crawl his way out of this passage for a gulp of air and look at the light. But the passage was never ending, never ending. Then a voice from somewhere, only it wasn't a voice, but a transmitted thought ordered him to crawl sideways. How can I if there's a wall in the way, he thought. Yet the order was incontestable, and it weighed on him as heavily as the other weight flattening his body. With a groan, he crawled sideways, and indeed he found he could do it as easily as when he'd been crawling forward. He was just getting used to going to the left when he conceived an order to crawl to the right. He moaned and got moving. He was weighed down by it all, yet there was still no light, no sign of the tunnel's end. The same distinct voice ordered him to turn right at the double. He worked his way with his elbows and feet, and in spite of the impenetrable wall on his right, he crawled on, and it seemed to work. Then he was called to wheel to the left, again at the double. By now, his doubts had gone. He didn't need to think. He worked his way left with his elbows and pushed on. His neck kept getting caught, jarring through his head. He'd never been in such a fix in his life. It would be a pity to die there, without reaching the end. But suddenly, his legs lightened, as if they had been inflated with air. They began to rise, although his chest and head were still pressed against the ground. He listened, but no order came. And then he realized that perhaps there was a way out. He would let his legs float out of the tube, crawl backward after them, and climb out. Sure enough, he began to move backwards, pushing himself up with his hands. Goodness knows where he found the strength. He began to crawl back after his legs through the hole. It was a narrow hole, but it was made really difficult by the blood flowing down to his head, so that he thought he was going to die right there, and that his head would burst. He gave another little push with his hands, against the walls and scratched all over, managed to crawl out. He found himself sitting on a pipe on a construction site. There was nobody there. The working day was obviously over. The earth was muddy and soggy around him. He had sat down on the pipe for a rest and saw a girl sitting next to him in dirty overalls, her head uncovered her straw-like hair hanging loosely without comb or pin. The girl was not looking at him. She just sat there. But she was expecting him to ask her a question. He knew that. At first he was frightened, but then he realized she was even more afraid of him than he of her. He was not in the mood to talk, but she was so intense waiting for his question that he asked her, 
Where is your mother, young lady? I don't know, she answered, looking down at her feet and biting her fingernails. What do you mean you don't know? He began to grow angry. You must know, and you, you must tell me truthfully, and write down everything as it is. Why don't you say something? For the second time, where is your mother? That's what I'd like to ask you. She looked at him, and her eyes were all water. It struck right through him, and came to him several times. Not piecemeal, but all at once. She must be the daughter of Grusha, the press operator, who had been run in for gossiping against the leader of the peoples. She must have brought him a form that wasn't properly filled out because she'd hidden this fact about her mother. So he'd summoned her and threatened to have her charged with not filling out her form properly. And then she had poisoned herself, but looking at her hair and her eyes now, it struck him that she must have drowned herself. It struck him too that she had guessed who he was. And it also struck him that if she had drowned herself and he was sitting next to her, then he must be dead too. He broke out in a sweat. He wiped the sweat away and said to her, Who? it's hot in here. Where can I get a drink of water? Do you know? There, the girl nodded. She pointed to a box or a trough full of stale rainwater mixed with greenish clay. It struck him again that this was the water that she had swallowed. And now she wanted him to choke on it too. If she wanted that, then surely he must still be alive. I'll tell you what, he tried a trick to get rid of her. Would you just run over there and call the foreman? Tell him to bring me my boots. How can I walk like this? The girl nodded, jumped off the pipe and splashed through the puddles. Bareheaded, untidy, in overalls and high boots girls wear on construction sites. He was so thirsty, he decided to take a drink, even if it was out of the trough. Nothing would happen to him if he drank just a little. He climbed down and noticed with amazement that he wasn't slipping on the mud. The soil under his feet was nondescript. Everything around him was nondescript, and in the distance there was nothing to be seen. He could have walked on like this, but suddenly... He was afraid that he had lost an important document. He went through his pockets, all of them at once, more quickly than his hands could do the job, and he realized, yes, he had lost it. At once he became frightened, terribly frightened. Outsiders must not read documents like that nowadays. He could get in deep trouble. Instantly he realized he'd lost it as he was climbing out of the tube. He walked quickly back, but was unable to find the place. He could not even recognize it. There was no tube there. Instead, there were workers wandering all over the place. And, worst of all, they might find it. The workers were all young men, and he didn't know any of them. One fellow in a welder's canvas jacket with shoulder flaps stopped and looked at him. Why was he staring at him like that? Had he found it? Hey, young man, do you have a match? Asked Rusanov. But you don't smoke, answered the welder. They knew everything. How did they know that? I need matches for something else. What else? The welder scrutinized him. Really, what a stupid answer. A typical saboteur's reply. They might detain him, and in the meantime, the document would be found. That's what the matches were for, of course. To burn it. The young man came closer and closer. Rusanov was very frightened. He knew what was going to happen. The young man looked straight at him in the eye and said clearly and distinctly, Since Yelchanskaya has, so to speak, entrusted her daughter to me, I conclude that she regards herself as guilty and that she is awaiting arrest. Rusanov started to shiver. How do you know that? It was a rather pointless question because it was clear that the young man had just read his report. His last remark came from it 
word for word. But the welder said nothing and went on his way. Rasanov started rushing about. Obviously, his report was lying somewhere nearby. He must find it soon. He must. Dashing between walls, turning corners, his heart leapt ahead. But his legs couldn't keep up. His legs were moving so slowly. He was desperate, desperate. At last, he spotted his paper. He knew at once it must be the right one. He wanted to run and pick it up, but his legs would not carry him. He went down on all fours and, pushing himself mainly with his hands, moved toward the paper. If only no one else grabbed it first. If only no one got there before him and tore it out of his hands. Closer, closer. At last he'd grabbed it. It was the paper. But he had no strength left in his fingers, not even to tear it up. He would lay face down on the ground, covering it with his body. Somebody touched him on the shoulder. He resolved not to turn around, not to let the paper escape from under him. But the touch was soft. A woman's hand. It struck Rasanov. It must be Yelchinskaya herself. My friend, she said softly, bending right down to his ear. Well, my friend, tell me, where's my daughter? Where did you take her? She is in a good place, Yelena Fedorovna. Don't worry, Rusanov replied, without turning his head toward her. Where? In a children's home. What children's home? She wasn't interrogating him. Her voice was sad. I don't know what to tell you, really. He'd have liked to tell her the truth, but he didn't know what it was. He hadn't sent the daughter away himself, and they might easily have transferred her from the original place. Is she living under my name? The questioning voice behind his back was almost tender. No. No, Rasanov told her sympathetically. They have a rule there. Names have to be changed. I can't do anything about it. It's a rule. Lying there, he remembered how he'd rather liked the Yelchansky couple. He had borne them no ill will, and if he had had to denounce the old man, it was only because Shoshenko had asked him to. Yelchansky had been in his way professionally. After the husband was arrested, Rusonov had helped the wife and daughter quite sincerely, and later on, when she was expecting to be arrested herself, she had entrusted her daughter to him. How he had come to denounce the wife as well he couldn't remember. He turned his head to look at her, but she wasn't there. She wasn't there at all. How could she be? She was dead. Something stabbed inside his neck, on the right-hand side. He straightened his head, still lying on the ground. He needed a rest. He was tired. More tired than he'd ever been before. His whole body ached. He was lying in a mine shaft, in a gallery. His eyes had already got used to the dark, and beside him on the ground, which was littered with small pieces of coal, he noticed a telephone. He was very surprised. How could a telephone have got here? Could it be connected? If so, he could ring and ask someone to bring him a drink. In fact, he could ask to be taken to a hospital. He lifted the receiver. Instead of a dial tone, he heard a vigorous, business-like voice. Comrade Rosonov! Yes, yes! Rosonov quickly pulled himself together. He knew at once that the voice came from above, not below. Please come to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court? Yes, of course, right away. Very good. He was about to put down the receiver when he remembered. Uh, excuse me, which Supreme Court, the old or the new? The new one, the voice answered coldly. Kindly hurry. And the receiver was put down. He recalled what he knew about the changes in the Supreme Court, and he cursed himself for being the first to pick up the receiver. Matulovich was gone. Klopov was gone. Yes, even Beria was gone. What times these were. But he had to obey. He was too weak to get up, but now he'd been summoned. He knew 
that he had to. He strained all his limbs, hauled himself up and fell down like a calf that still hasn't learned how to walk. True, they hadn't told him the exact time, but they had said hurry. At last, supporting himself against a wall, he got to his feet, dragged himself along on weak, unsteady feet, all the time clinging to the wall. He didn't know why, but there was a pain in his neck on the right-hand side. He walked along wondering, would they really put him on trial? Could they possibly be so cruel as to try him after all these years? What a thing to do, changing the membership of the court. It wouldn't be a change for the better. What could he do? With all his respect for the higher court in the land, the only course left to him was to defend himself. He would find the courage to do so. This is what he would tell them. I have not been the one to pronounce sentence, nor have I conducted investigations. I have only signaled my suspicions. I found a scrap of newspaper in a public laboratory with a torn up photograph of the leader. It was my duty to pick it up and signal it. It's the investigator's job to check it out. It may have been a coincidence or it may not. The investigation's organs are there to discover the truth. All I did was carry out my simple duty as a citizen. This was what he would tell them. All these years, it has been vital to make society healthy, morally healthy. This can't be done without purging society, and a purge can't be conducted without men who aren't squeamish about using a dung shovel. And these arguments developed in his brain. He got more and more flustered about how he would put them over. Now he was eager to get there and to be summoned to the court as soon as possible. Then he would simply shout at them, I wasn't the only one. Why put me on trial? Name one man who didn't do what I did. How could he hang on to his post if he didn't help? You mentioned Guzman. He went to prison, didn't he? He was as tense as if he was already shouting his speech, but then he noticed that he wasn't really shouting. It was just that his throat was swollen and hurting. He seemed to be walking along an ordinary corridor now, not at a mine gallery. Someone behind him called, Pashka, what's wrong with you? Are you ill? Why are you dragging yourself along like that? He felt more cheerful, and he walked on, it seemed, as if he were quite all right. He turned around to see who it was. It was Zvenik, in a tunic, with a shoulder belt. Where are you off to, John? asked Pavel, wondering why the other was so young. That is, he was young, of course, but hadn't that been a long time ago? Where am I going? Same place as you, of course. To the commission. What commission? Pavel tried to work it out. He knew he'd been summoned somewhere else, but he couldn't quite remember where. He fell into step with Zvenik, and they walked along, cheerfully and briskly, like young men. He felt he was under twenty, not yet married. Now they were walking through a big office. There sat the intelligentsia behind their desks, old accountants wearing ties and beards that made them look like priests engineers with little crossed hammers on the lapels of their jackets, elderly aristocratic-looking ladies, young typists, heavily made up with skirts above their knees. As soon as he and Zvenik marched in, their four boots thumping in perfect time, all thirty people in the room turned toward them. Some of them stood up, others bowed in their seats, all followed their progress with their eyes, and on every face was a look of terror, which Pavel and Jan found flattering. They entered the next room, greeted the other members of the commission, and sat down at a table with a red tablecloth. All right, let's get started. Venka, the president, commanded. They began. The first to come in was Aunt Grusha, a press operator. And what are you doing here? Aunt Grusha asked Venka in amusement. 
We are purging the administration. How does that concern you? How have you wormed your way into administration? Everyone burst out laughing. No, nothing like that. You see, Aunt Grusha was not in the least put out. It's my daughter. She's getting bigger now, and I must find a kindergarten for her, you see. All right, Aunt Grusha, called Pavel. Write out your application, and we'll arrange things. We'll fix it up for your daughter. Now don't interrupt us anymore. We are going to purge the intelligentsia. He stretched out a hand to pour himself some water out of a carafe. But the carafe turned out to be empty. He nodded to his neighbor to ask him to pass a carafe from the other end of the table. It was passed to him, but that one was empty too. He was so thirsty that it felt as if his throat was on fire. Give me a drink, he called out. I must have a drink. In a moment, said Dr. Gangart. We'll bring you some water in a moment. Rusanov opened his eyes. She was sitting beside him on the bed. There's some stewed fruit juice in my bedside table, he said weakly. He felt feverish and was aching all over. His head was beating like a drum. All right, we'll give you some juice. Gangart's thin lips broke into a smile. She opened the bedside table and took out the bottle and a glass. To judge from the windows, it was a sunny evening. Out of the corner of his eyes, Pavel Nikolaevich watched Gangart pouring out the juice to make sure she didn't slip anything into it. The bittersweet juice was piercingly delicious. Pavel Nikolaevich lay back on his pillow, emptied the glass Gangart was holding for him. I felt awful today, he complained. Oh, you came through all right, said Gangart, disagreeing. It's just that today was... It's just that today we increased your dose. Rusanov was stabbed by another suspicion. What did you say? You mean you're going to increase it every time? From now on, it'll be the same dose as you had today. You'll get used to it. It won't be so bad in future. What about the supreme... He began, but cut himself short. He was already confused between delirium and the real world. That was the end of chapter 16. Let me take a quick look at how long chapter 17 is. If it's just a few pages, then I'll go ahead and knock it out as well. Let's see, two, two, tw no, that's 16 pages. That would be like an hour and a half for me. So we're going to sit here and, and we're going to do 17 tomorrow at 9 p.m. Central Time. Uh, if you're on Instagram or if you're on Periscope, there is now also a Twitch. Uh, it's Twitch TV. No, it's twitch.tv slash the Carter Banks Hour. So if you want to uh, view via Twitch, you can... Uh, attend that as well. Um, there should be a link in my Instagram bio. I was toying with the idea today of getting some mugs made, possibly, uh, with the Carter Banks hour on them. Just toying with the idea. We will see if that's something you guys would be interested in uh, getting. Definitely let me know. Thanks for tuning in.